Welcome back. I'm Shane, this is Relative Time, and today we have a channel first. For quite some time now, I've been wanting to review a mechanical chronograph, but typically Japanese and Swiss chronos aren't cheap. And if you have a channel focused on affordable watches, that means they're kind of outside your scope, if not outside your production budget. The exception to that are these Chinese chronographs that use a mechanical seagull movement. And you can find them from around 200 up to 350 bucks. They're pretty cool, especially from an affordable standpoint. And I've been meaning to review one for quite some time, but just never found the opportunity. Well, a while ago, Mercur watches reached out and they offered to give me a Panda version to review. So I figured it was the perfect opportunity to do just that. Now, the first time I ever heard about Mercur was when watching a review by Dave over at Just The Watch. But a couple of weeks ago, I noticed on Instagram that they sent Dave the exact same watch. Now, in the past, Dave and I have done a few joint premieres when we have a similar watch, and we're always on the lookout to do another. So this also seemed like another perfect opportunity. So after you're done here, make sure you go check out Dave's take on this. But that's enough talking about it. Let's just get to it. Now, first off, let's talk about that brand name that's on the dial as well as what they put on the crown. I've never really been a fan of big and lengthy names, and especially not when they're put on the dial. For me, just keep it short and keep it clean. There are a few exceptions to this, but I think it just makes the dial look cluttered. However, what's worse is that when an Asian brand tries to co-op an Italian or a French sounding name, never quite sure why they do this. Maybe they think it sounds more sophisticated, for me, it just doesn't work at all. I mean, I don't really know who Pierre Paulin is, and I don't really care, but I'd actually prefer it if it just said Mercur. Now that that's out of the way, let's get to the watch itself. Not only does this Panda have a vintage style, but also size. You're looking at a 38mm width without, and 41mm with the crown. And meanwhile, lug to lug is just under 47 which might be proportionally a little long for a 38, so I think this does wear a little larger. But these slender curved lugs also help it stay right where it needs to on your wrist, and as a whole I'd say it's pretty comfortable. It has a nice solid feel to it in the hand, but overall it's pretty light at 57 grams, so easily one you could wear all day. The strap could be a little better, but we'll get to that later. The biggest downside here in terms of specs is going to be in total thickness, as you're looking at a watch that's just under 15 millimeters tall. But a lot of that is due to the very tall and very vintagey domed polymer crystal, which brings both positive and negatives to the overall design. While the crystal is rather tall, it looks simply fantastic and has a high degree of clarity. Sometimes you can't even tell there's a crystal there until you get to some extreme angles. And this then just brings up the whole polymer versus sapphire debate. Polymer is softer and much easier to scratch. And at this height, you probably will scratch it. But it's also easier to buff out those scratches yourself. Whereas sapphire is much harder to scratch. But once you do, you almost need to swap out the crystal in order to fix it. Now for me, I just prefer to avoid scratches to begin with. So I naturally prefer sapphire and I see this polymer crystal as a negative. Yet there are a ton of people out there who would disagree with that, and they'd see this as a huge positive. So it just kind of depends on where you fall in this debate. Now, rounding out the specs, we also have a rather minimal water resistance at 30 meters. And one of the things I realized while filming this is that this is the first 18 millimeter watch I've done in quite some time. From running this channel, I now have a ton of 20 and 22 millimeter straps, but I don't have a lot of 18, so I pretty much just used whatever I had. But I have to say that I completely fell in love with the look of this on a leather bun strap, and I think you would too. Anyway, let's move on to the case, and for the price, which is about 180 bucks after discount, I think is pretty good. The sides are polished, while the top has a circular brushed finishing, as well as a stepping up effect from the case to the bezel to the domed crystal. The case is rather minimal in design, really acting as sort of a circular frame for the domed crystal and dial beneath. 
And at the right, we have the signed crown as well as the chrono pushers. Everything here looks good in proportion, but the feel and the response of those pushers is truly the real star here. And as soon as you use it, you'll know exactly what I mean and why people dislike some of the mushy quartz chronos out there. This is simply a great looking watch and it's really hard to go wrong with a panda. But as good as this view is, the view from the rear is even better with a very, very open exhibition case back showing off the Seagull chronograph movement. Not only is it just cool to look at and just take in the depth and the complexity of the chronograph movement, but I have to say that Seagull did a fantastic job with the finishing here. It's just gorgeous to look at. I think even people who dismiss Chinese movements have to admit this thing looks good. And as long as we're looking at it, we might as well talk about it. Now, generally watch geeks and enthusiasts tend to avoid Chinese movements. They just have a reputation of not having the same quality or reliability as their Japanese and Swiss counterparts. However, a lot of people are warming up to these Siegel mechanical chronographs, mostly because there isn't any other non-quartz alternative for an affordable watch. So if you're curious and you don't want to spend a grand or so, this is pretty much it. Now, originally these started gaining traction with the 1963 Chinese Air Force remakes. And now you're starting to see them used in other designs, such as we have here. And even a few Western micro brands are starting to use them. So they are gaining traction, but even with that, you might have some trouble getting one serviced at your local shop. Now, this is a mechanical two-eyed chrono with a running seconds at the nine and a 30 minute chrono elapsed at the three. You're also looking at a standard beat rate, 42 hour power reserve, but no hacking. So maybe a little bit of a compromise there, as well as a compromise in being a straight mechanical. I know personally, I would love to find an automatic version, but as far as I know, Siegel isn't making one. And accuracy was pretty decent on this particular one, gaining only nine seconds a day. So all things considered, it's pretty good for what it is. But there is one other thing I noticed, and that's that the ticking is a bit loud. It's not Timex loud, mind you, but I would definitely notice it sitting in a quiet room at my desk. So definitely not one I'd keep on my nightstand at night. Anyway, let's move on to the dial. And for those that don't like a straight panda, I think there is a reverse panda also available. Now sitting on the outer edge, you have a pitch black matte dial with a tachometer printed on in white basically giving you that classic chalkboard-like look. Now, moving to the center, there's a very tiny step up to the main white area of the dial, before it then sinks back down for the chronograph subdials. There's a painted, detailed chapter ring on the outer edge of the white section, just right before you get to the applied indices. And those indices are very small silver bars with white loom squares atop, kind of like a mini letter I. Now the stick subdial hands are a flat white, and I think it offers a ton of contrast against the black backdrop. Yet the main hands don't offer near as much contrast. You have a thin silver frame with a thin white loom center. And there is a fair amount of loom here, so that center does have an occasional green glow. Now overall, this is a great classic look. But from a functionality standpoint, there's not a lot of contrast here even more so with the white chronograph hand. So I think this is one area that the reverse panda has an advantage, but I have to say personally that even with that advantage, I still prefer the look of a classic panda. In fact, this is one of the first watches that my wife saw and immediately really liked it. And I have a feeling she's actually gonna steal it later on. Now, due to the addition of the tachometer, I think the hour hand looks a little bit short. But I don't think it really is, and I think all the hands have a great length. The hour hand goes right to the indices, and the minute hand goes right to the detailed chapter ring, while the chrono second hand just sits right over the tachometer and floats across it as it runs. And even beyond that, I think everything, including the subdial positioning and the size, just looks good in proportion to each other. And I want to give Merker here a lot of credit and maybe an apology for mispronouncing their name a few times. But I want to give them a lot of credit here for just how good and how clean every aspect of this watch looks in macro. And that's especially impressive for the price. 
Not to mention that the hands are nicely lined up. And that's more than I can say for the last few Mecha Quartz watches I've looked at. It is honestly a gorgeous clean looking chrono. However, I do have one issue with the design, and that's the text on the dial. Now, I've already talked about the branding at the top, but I think that goes for the text at the bottom as well. That text is small and not overly obtrusive, but none of it is really necessary here. I mean, I don't really care how many jewels are in the movement, and I already know it's a mechanical chronograph. So my suggestion would be just to remove all of it and have a nice, clean and simple logo at the top. Now, as for the loom, well, I honestly wasn't expecting a whole lot here, but I wound up being pleasantly surprised. So for comparison tests, I threw in a Vostok Amphibia, my Hamilton Khaki King and the Seiko Turtle. And I found it interesting that the three on the left all look similar in the dark. But the important thing to note here is that the Panda outlasted the Amphibia Diver, and it almost kept up with that Hamilton. And when you consider the limited surface area of the hands and the indices, that's pretty good. Now let's get to the strap before I really wrap things up. It's this tannish gray genuine leather strap with a signed buckle. It's one that should last you, but I think it does feel a bit cheap. It's also kind of an odd color to combine with a Panda and it has this kind of odd suede texture. So overall, the strap is okay, and I think it's okay for the price, but ultimately, it's kind of forgettable. And personally, I just swap it out as soon as you get it, if for no other reason than to make the watch look a little more interesting. And last, let's talk about value. On their site, they have it listed for 229, but they did give me a $50 off discount code, and that brings it down to 179 which I think is pretty good for what you're getting. Most other watches with this movement start at that point and go all the way up to 350. So this is definitely on the lower side of that. And I think it's a great alternative if you don't like that design. The 1963 definitely has a unique character, but it's always hard to beat a panda. Personally, there's a few things I'd tweak, like say Sapphire, but as a whole, it's a great looking watch at a pretty good price. And even if you're serious about getting something like, say, a Speedmaster in the future, this could be a stepping stone in that direction, if for no other reason than to just get a taste of what a mechanical chronograph is like. But that's my take on the Pierre Paula and Panda. Still not a fan of that name, but it is what it is here. So let me know what you think about this watch down below and how you think it might compare to a 1963. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for joining me, and make sure you go check out Dave's take on this as well. See you next time.